Hi, I am Dr. Kim Sage. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Welcome to my YouTube channel and to this video series called Healing Love or healing the love inside and just healing love, giving it to others in a way that helps heal often the attachment wounds and the trauma stories we're carrying in our hearts and lives and our bodies and nervous systems. So if you're new here, I would love for you to join this little growing community and check that little box. And that way you'll get notified when I post new videos. And if you are a returning subscriber or visitor, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome back. Today's video is about how people who have a more avoidant style can engage in sabotaging behaviors around intimacy and vulnerability. We just talked about when those who are more anxious, kind of what they might do. But the truth is that many of those people who have a more avoidant style long for intimacy. They long for connection. But in childhood, remember, these were the children who were the research describes as those who experienced repeated maternal rejection. Now, it wasn't overt rejection. It was when the child had attempts and needs and bids for connection, meaning reaching out, needing emotions regulated, uh, engaging over things that weren't just conditional about being the good child or, or you know being a good athlete or whatever was happening. There's a kind of conditionality and a minimization of emotions that the child interprets, this is so important, the child interprets the parents dismissing, that's why it's often called dismissive, the dismissing of the child's needs, the child interprets as rejection. And so the child starts to deactivate. In other words, as opposed to activating and trying to get you closer, they kind of retreat and say, no thanks, uh, I've learned I'm not going to get my needs met. Going back to the research of the strange situation, these are babies who watched mom like leave the room, didn't really cry too much, didn't get too upset, but deep inside they were freaking out just as much. Their cortisol levels were high, their heart, their blood pressure was high. They had already learned though to not show it. And so these are the people in the world who your partner potentially, who you think they don't care about me, they're not motivated for this relationship. And often, in t often at times, they are panicked inside, but you oftentimes won't see it because they don't know how to share it. Intimacy is scary and dangerous and unsafe. And so what they do to minimize intimacy and vulnerability when it feels like it's too much is they engage in certain strategies to, to sort of remove themselves. And they are actually suppressing their attachment system from a biological perspective inside too, right? We're wired for connection. That is the heart of attachment. These are none of these videos, and my belief, and, and the heart of attachment is that we are not, that the codependency is not a thing. In, in addiction, it is. But the idea that we are wired to need each other, and that without each other, we don't and didn't survive. It's just about how we show up and how we do that. That's the heart of it, right? So it's not about demonizing, oh, you're avoidant and you do all these things. It's about understanding where it comes from and then working to change and heal and improve those behaviors. So some of the deactivating strategies they use, number one is, and I'm using this book for this particular video, though I mostly use a textbook, which I'll, I've talked a lot about, which is about uh, treating adult attachment disturbances by David Brown and Dan Elliott, which I really love because it goes into a lot of the research. It's a great book if you are a therapist, not a great book so much if you are not a therapist or a clinician. So, okay, so the first thing is they will say or think things like, I'm not ready to commit. And even though they've been in the relationship with you for years, right? They're basically, I'm gonna move my laptop. They're basically saying they don't wanna commit, but they're basically in a committed relationship. But there's something about taking the step towards more, let's say moving in together or getting married that would make them feel psychologically like that's too far into the attachment dynamic, I can't do that. So there's a mismatch there. They might focus on imperfections. This is very, very common in everybody I've ever worked with with avoidant attachment. They will pick on things like um, the way the person dresses, the way they talk, the way they eat, uh, the job they have, the way they do certain things. It's like these little nitpicky ways to kind of say, yeah, but I don't know if they're the one for me or maybe they're not quite you know, good enough for me. And then it starts to sabotage the way they engage in the relationship, whether there's an, you know, attraction issues or commitment issues. But really, 
I mean, yes, we all have little things we don't like about our partners. You know, I don't like the way you leave the cap off the toothpaste or I wish you could change your wardrobe. But, you know, at the heart of it, we want to try to look at the relationship overall. And so when it feels too threatening for those who have a more avoidant style or they're afraid to lean in further, they will find these little ways to, to kind of like nitpick, to kind of pull themselves out of it. Like they're not good enough anyway, so I need to, that protects my heart in some way. They often have these longings for their ex that got away and they're always holding that person up, even though it was a disaster of a relationship or it was clearly not a good fit. I have like crazy hair today. Um, they will basically pine after them and hold them as the gold standard. Meanwhile, if you could transport them back in time to that relationship, you would see how unhappy they were and why it didn't work, but they often forget that. They will flirt with others sometimes to create more insecurity and instability in the relationship, which if you can imagine if you're a more anxious person or lean that way, or even for anybody, like it doesn't, I don't know who like enjoys even secure attachment, their partner overtly flirting with someone else now, it can be perceived as flirting if it's friendliness, if a person is very jealous, but we're talking about from this perspective as a deactivating strategy, a way of introducing, like, maybe I'm not quite into this, which, as I said, you can imagine how that goes. It doesn't go well. It causes the other partner to pull back, and that gives the avoidant, oh, yeah, you're pulling back. I feel a little safety. There's a reduction of vulnerability there, but then if you look at how that affects the overall relationship, it's not good. The next one is not saying I love you while implying you have feelings, or I would also say being very conditional about when they say I love you. And so really it's about, you know, not wanting to say the words because somehow that implies something that in their body feels really unsafe. But meanwhile, they're acting and engaging in very loving, you know, classic loving behaviors. They might pull away right when things are going well. This is very, very common. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're hanging out, they're calling you, you're doing great, and it got really great and intimate. And the next thing you know, they don't call you for three or four days. And then that creates a rupture that then a secure person or anxious person starts to pull back also, like maybe they don't like me. And you can see how that little, that little thing can potentially cause a big rupture. They can form re uh, relationships with an impossible future. For example, someone who is married, that's also very common because if you're married and don't want to leave your spouse and we're having an affair, well, I'm that, that's a great way to make sure you never actually ex, uh, expect me to be fully vulnerable and monogamous and in this relationship. So it's like a safety zone there. They can check out mentally when the partner is talking. They often don't pay attention to little details. It's like the person will say, didn't you hear what I just said? And I think that can happen for lots of reasons, even from a more trauma dissociated perspective, from an ADHD or concentration or memory issue. There can be all kinds of reasons why, or PTSD issue. But in some ways, it's actually in the context of vulnerability, a way to not feel. So like, let's say we're in a relationship and I'm talking about my really sad feelings about my parent or my kids. Um, and you sort of disconnect from me and I can feel that you're there, but you're not there, that that creates another little rupture. Like I'm like, do you really care about me? And then I might act different and pull back. And for you, it might be that this is getting really emotional and vulnerable and I really care about you if I'm avoiding. And now that you're sharing your vulnerabilities and fears and sadnesses, that forces me to feel and dig into my feelings. And I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to label my feelings, I don't know how to identify them, or if I do, it feels really scary and dangerous, and so I have to distance myself. And then the last two are keeping secrets and leaving things foggy, which is basically a way to just kind of one more foot is just potentially on the other side of the bed, it's out the door, whatever the expression is, right? It's like, I guess, one foot on the floor, so I'm trying to say, and so it kind of keeps you like, yeah, well, you know, I'll keep this like mystique going on, so you're not totally sure if I'm in it, and I can kind of like always say, well, I, I didn't I didn't technically say I was fully in it. I didn't tell you that I wasn't with somebody else or I wasn't dating somebody else. Meanwhile, you weren't, but it's the illusion of that. And that once again creates a vulnerability trigger in other partners. And lastly, avoiding physical closeness, not wanting to have intimacy times together, not walking with your partner, not wanting to share the same bed. I mean, it's a huge issue with a lot of couples, which is, I get it, the sleeping issues are difficult with people snoring and stuff. But over time, I can see couples with very young children who've already started sleeping in separate bedrooms for years. And obviously, every couple has a different desire and every person has a different desire. 
for the amount of intimacy and the frequency and all of those things. But for avoided people, it's like it can be a, a good excuse. Not that it isn't a rational one, but it can be another way to avoid connection and avoid talking about feelings and avoid leaning in. And so all of those are ways that avoidant people can really have a difficult time with um, dealing with their own vulnerability and their partners. And so they engage in all these strategies, like I said, going back to childhood to help them deal with that flood of uncomfortableness, especially around intense emotion and, and, um, and really true intimacy. And so if this is you or your partner, I think understanding where it comes from is important and then working at ways working through ways to deal with what it feels like in your body when you want to let's say if you're avoidant ignore emotions or when your partner says hey babe you just like weren't present for that conversation just now when I was crying even though you were physically here you weren't here and instead of saying yes I was I heard every word you said and like parroting it back you pause right you think about yeah I, maybe I didn't, and I'm so sorry. And you know what? As I, I sit with myself, I realize it hurts me to see you hurting, or I get scared that you won't be able to handle what's happening, let's say if we're single parents with your kids, and then you'll end this relationship, and I don't want you to do that. And so I kind of remove myself, or whatever's happening. It's important to own your part in it, and then together work on how to heal those connections together. So we're going to talk more about that. But that is how your childhood at the core, right, whether your vulnerable uh, fears are high or low, how they show up in your attachment style and how then you show up in other relationships. And so that's the core of understanding and helping us all, I hope, just add little ways to help heal ourselves and our lives and relationships. So thank you so much for being here. Please don't forget to follow me, by the way, on TikTok, where I post every day, at least once a day, if not more always about these topics also because once you pick a topic and TikTok doesn't really promote videos uh and outside your niche that's just the truth and so you think oh no one cares about these videos so i still do them sometimes but the core of it is because this is my passion is really all about attachment complex trauma relationships and childhood wounds and, and parenting wounds so i will see you tomorrow please stay safe and well and take